Today we'll talk about uh, the Apache bootstrapping in the multi-party setting. Um, this is joint work with John Gun Park, a postdoctoral researcher at COSIC, and uh, we did this work uh, while I was doing a research stay at uh, COSIC. I'm uh, from Universitat Punto Fabra in Spain. So uh, first I wanted to start by giving the motivation on why we, we did this work. So in FHE, uh, it's very useful if you have um, FHE schemes which are uh, by default able to handle multiple users, okay? The main uh, FHE schemes are normally designed in a single key setting, uh, but having uh, FHE schemes that can handle multiple users is very useful if you want to realize uh, real world applications. At the moment, we have two main approaches to do so. We have the multi key and the multi party approach. I will talk about them later. And when we started this work, the state of the art was like this. So you had uh, extensions for the main uh, single key encryption schemes to the multi key and the multi party setting uh, for BCB, BFB, and CKPS. And for DFHE, there was only this LMA, LMAK paper, which um, built a way to do bootstrapping, but um, using non-binary secret keys. Then um, we, we then saw the paper by Joan Pallier, which I will talk about this later as well, which also built a way to do bootstrapping in DFHE for the uh, non-binary key uh, secret key case. So we decided to try to extend this work and see if we could uh, make it work for the DFHE case, okay? I want to take this opportunity to show that the, another interest for extending DFHE is to have uh, um, access to fast bootstrapping in this setting as well, since all the different um, if single key FHE schemes have different advantages and disadvantages. So having a multi-party version of the FHE is also very convenient. So I have divided this lecture or talk uh, in two parts. One is going to be very easy, just a recap on polymorphic encryption very quick. And then I will explain what is multi-key and multi-party FHE. And then I will move to the actual construction that we did. So a quick recap uh, in homomorphic encryption, what we can do is to um, work over encrypted data without having access to the secret key. So the typical example is delegation of computation. Imagine that you have a very small PC and a supercomputer. Then what you might want to do is to send some message to the supercomputer and get a function evaluated on that message. Of course, if you do the do, uh, if you send us things like this, uh, you don't have privacy. So what you can do is to, to create a public and secret key as the, as the user and send your message encrypted uh, using a single key encrypt, uh, homomorphic encryption scheme. And what you get back is a ciphertext, such a way that when you decrypt the ciphertext, you get actually the function uh, over the message that you wanted evaluated, but has, everything has been done in the um, cipher text domain. So the supercomputer doesn't have access to the secret key. Uh, and what you want is compactness as well, that uh, the cipher text that you get is independent of the function that is being evaluated. So let's try to um, generalize this and consider multiple parties. So we have here two parties. And just for the sake of example, I, I use the machine learning based diagnosis, which is very common. So we have two hospitals and we want to do inference or train a machine learning model in a supercomputer using data from both hospitals. Okay, so we have um, hospital A, we could do that like this. Hospital A generates a public and secret key and then shares this public key to hospital B. This work could be done by a, another uh, trusted party as well. Uh, what we can do, is sent some data to the server encrypted under the public key, and then get back a function that takes both inputs from hospital A and hospital B, okay? Um, but this approach, since it's a single key setting, has many problems. Uh, 
the clear one is that we don't have input privacy. So hospital A can just decrypt the, the encryption that is sent by hospital B. Okay. So now we we want to use uh, a more clever uh, idea to handle multiple users using homomorphic encryption. So let's just take hospital A and hospital B, and they can just generate a public and secret key independent, independently. Okay. And uh, maybe send send the data to the to the supercomputer. Okay. But if we send this data to the supercomputer, since the data is encrypted under two different public keys, the supercomputer will not be able to uh, evaluate the circuit. I'm skipping a lot of details here, but for the sake of simplicity, let's assume that's true. And uh, what we want to do is to take the encryptions that hospital A, hospital B can produce and extend them to a, cy a ciphertext form that is common for both parties. Okay. So let's take this very simple idea. If we think about the encryption uh, function as a circuit, it can be evaluated homomorphically. Okay. So what happens if we evaluate homomorphically this circuit on input the encryption of MA with under public key A? Okay. So if we do this, we get uh, this kind of onion encryption. Okay, so we, we would get the encryption of MA under public key B. Okay, this has happened homomorphically. And uh, after that, we have the encryption of public key A. Okay. If uh, at the beginning, we'll, we already had the encryption of under public key B, since we want to preserve this order, we can just take the public key and encrypt it. Okay. So now we have uh, that the, the encryptions are under the same. Uh, structure. And this is exactly what we want. With this, the server can uh, give us back the, the result, and then we can do a uh, decryption process, which I didn't explain here due to lack of time, but it involves partial decryption and communication between A and B. But the key idea here is that in the multi key setting, what you need is to take your, your ciphertext and extend it to a common domain okay, in order to be able to do computations. This presents two problems. Um, the constructions that are currently available um, require this ex ciphertext expansion, which is uh, its own computation that needs to be done. And um, this makes a ciphertext grow. Okay? So some constructions have linearly and the worst one quadratically. So these are not desirable properties. So what we can do is for is use the multi-party approach uh, that could solve these problems. Okay. So consider the same as scenarios before. We have two, the two hospitals. Both of them generate the, a pair independently of public and secret keys, and uh, they uh, they want to send information to the supercomputer for processing. Okay. So instead of doing this expansion, instead of creating this new uh, ciphertext in this common domain, what we can do is exploit the fact that in current FHG schemes, we can add uh, public keys together, uh, intrinsically the secret keys, and get uh, a valid, a new valid uh, public key. Okay. So what we can do uh, as hospital A and hospital B, we can take both, both public keys, add them together, and then encrypt the message under this global public key. Okay. Notice that this doesn't, it's you're putting somehow the, the ciphertext in a in a common domain, but you don't expand it because this encryption is as if you were in the single key setting. You have a new public key, so you are in the single key setting. Okay. So to sum up this part, we have a, in the multi-key approach, the, it's, it's very flexible compared to the multi-party in the sense that parties can join and uh, move out of the protocol freely, so at, at any time, and it has fast uh, key generation. Okay. 
The problem is that we have this ciphertext expansion to move to the common domain. And this expansion requires uh, ciphertext to grow uh, at least uh, linearly or, uh, on the number of parties. On the other hand, you have the public uh, either multi-party homomorphic encryption schemes, which have a similar performance of single key FHG schemes, and you, you don't have any ciphertext expansion. On the contrast, uh, I will explain this later in, in much more detail, but we have uh, this problem that the, in the multi-party setting, we have an expensive setup phase. The setup phase comes from the fact that you need to build the bootstrapping keys, which are the keys that are used in FHG to get rid of the noise after some computation has been performed. Um, and this is quite expensive. And also the other very limiting factor about uh, multi-party HE is that the parties are fixed at the beginning. So at the beginning you fix uh, once and for all the parties that are going to participate on the protocol, you produce the keys, and then um, you cannot do anything else if a party wants to join. Uh, you need to start over. Okay. So this, this was the, the, the first part. Um, I'm happy to take any questions if there are any about this first part. I think I went a bit fast. So if we look to the chat, the first question uh, was in the terminology of HE uh, about talking about evaluation circuit. What was the reason for that? Uh, yes, yeah, so we, we normally talk about uh, circuits when we uh, think about what what are we are processing uh, in in the server side, but you Thank can you. think of them as as functions if if you want. But you basically translate it to to circuits. Yeah. I don't see the chat, by the way. Okay. A follow up question to that was: Is it hardware? Sorry, is it? The follow-up question was, is it uh, hardware? Uh, I, I'm not sure I understand the question. So you translate it, for example, in the TFHG case, you translate it to bullying gates. So, I, th I, think, I think the person asking the question is, um, is, is circuit is not meant in the hardware term. It's meant ah, no, no. in the exactly. description of the function. So yeah, yeah, exactly. When he says function, he means the function is described as a circuit, which is yes. a way of describing functions. It doesn't mean hardware circuit. Yes, exactly. Thank you, Major. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'll move on. So um, now to, to move on to the main uh, construction that we have done, we need to understand how the FHG bootstrapping works. Um, I will not go over the whole thing. Uh, you have a very nice uh, blog post uh, in Zama Deep Dive, which explains this very well. I will just uh, give a few remarks regarding the blind rotation part of the bootstrapping, which is what actually interests, interests me in here. So by rotation, uh, we just mean the rotation of a polynomial. Um, so we, we imagine that you have this polynomial P. So to rotate it, we just multiply by uh, x to the minus mu. And the rotation happens because we are working on uh, in, in this um, ring. Um, and we are doing, we are working mod uh, polynomials mod x to the n plus one, okay? So we have uh, this rotation. And by blind, we mean that we do this rotation uh, homomorphically. In particular, the exponent um, is encrypted, uh, is an encryption, okay? Uh, learning with arrows encryption. And what we want to do is to move from this encryption to a ring learning with arrows encryption of x to the minus mu times some vector v that it's called test polynomial in the literature okay so skipping a lot of details this minus mu can be written as uh this okay so if you look at how this is encrypted you will convince yourself that uh, this is true 
And uh, a remark here is that these are, uh, and this S here is binary. Okay, this is a normal EFHG uh, uh, secret key. Okay. So now, uh, if we want to compute this, we could start by taking uh, just x to the minus b, as here in the algorithm you can see this so called accumulator is just uh, x to the minus b times b. Okay. And uh, what we want to do is to multiply this by x to the a sub uh, j when S, uh, sj is one and uh, we don't multiply when S, S sub j is zero. Okay. So to control this, we just put the S's as encryptions, uh, ring GSW encryptions. I will not talk about what a ring GSW encryption is, but it's a type of uh, H encryption uh, as the bootstrapping keys of the scheme. Okay. So if we do this, what we can then uh, during the blind rotation step, if the bootstrapping key encrypts zero, uh, the whole thing goes to zero and we just keep the accumulator that we have before. And if we encrypt one, uh, we just multiply by X to the AJ for the corresponding J. So at the end of the rotation, we will have a ring learning with error encryption of X to the minus mu times B. Okay, this is the what blind rotation does in the binary case. Okay. So now let's uh, try to extend this to the non-binary case. This is what uh, Joan Pallier did in their work. So assume that instead of having a binary uh, secret key space, we have the following. We have a secret, uh, secret keys can be sampled from zero to K. Okay. Um, we can write x to the sj aj like this, where uh, this function here is just the indicator function. So if uh, a is equal to sj, then we have a one here, otherwise it's a zero. Okay. So if you look at this last equation, what controls uh, the sum is actually this indication function. So before the the, the product by X was controlled by uh, the secret key. Now it's, compro it's controlled by this indicator function. So this, uh, the idea now is to update the accumulator by taking the bootstrapping keys um, as this indication function, this indicator function, okay? So the ring CSWs will encrypt uh, this indicator function, which is either zero or one. And we can update the accumulator like this. Okay. Let's try to understand a bit more how these bootstrapping keys look like in this scheme. So let's consider this set uh, zero to four and this secret key. Okay. In here, I want to point out that this secret key could be very well obtained from the multi-party setting, because you can imagine that you have four parties. Each of them has sampled a secret key, a binary secret key. And then what you do uh, in the multi-party setting is add these keys together. Okay, so if you have uh, a global secret key and the distribution of this global secret key is going to be uh, sampled from this set S because you have four parties, okay? So this secret key could be one of these global uh, public uh, secret keys from the multi-party setting. Uh, recall that the bootstrapping keys are computed like this. And for simplicity, I will just denote uh, encryption, ring of the encryption by uh, m to the bar. Then what you can do uh, is iterate over j and i. Um, so if j is equal to one and i is equal to one, uh, we have that this uh, indicator function will give you a one. So you will put an encryption of one in this bootstrapping key. In case of j equal to one and i equal to two, then you have uh, a zero as the indicator, the indicator function. So you would encrypt a zero and so on and so forth. And if you do, then you, 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 you change j, you will get the all the possible 16 possible results uh, for the bootstrapping keys. 
Okay. So things to remark here, if you look, the, the bootstrapping keys look are encryptions of zero. Either they are an encryption of zero or an encryption of one. Okay. And if you only consider one J, you fix J, and then you iterate over S, you will have a vector that will only have a one at some position. And this position will be determined by the, the actual value of S. Okay. So let's see why um, taking this bootstrapping keys to the multi-party setting is a bit complicated. So imagine that we have uh, four parties, I was saying before, and we have a, a secret key from zero to one. So these uh, secret keys are normal TFHG uh, secret keys. And um, for example, let's assume that the, the parties have sampled this, this first value of the secret keys. So the first party has a first value of one, the second one, a one, one and zero for the last one, okay? So if you sum uh, these values, the first position of the global secret key is going to be free, okay? This is the secret key that is going to be intrinsically defined when you add the public keys of a multi-party HG scheme, okay? Um, Notice that in, in, in this setting, we have the same um, distribution, the same set where we pick the secret keys from. It is going to be zero to four, okay? And as before, the bootstrapping key, in this case, it's going to, to, to be like this. So you, when j is equal to one and y is equal to one, then you have a zero. And you will only get the one when uh, this, for j equal to one and i equal to three because we have a three here okay so the if if you only have if you consider the single key setting uh this is very easy because you can just see this right here and you can produce these good shopping keys but if you consider the multi-party setting uh each party has part of this uh, has these s's so nobody knows that s g uh, comma one is actually three that's that's information that it's never known by anybody. So the the tricky part is to go from bring GSW encryptions of um, these these uh, parts of the secret key to uh, ring GSW encryptions where you have all zeros and at some position determined by the the secret key you have a one. Okay, this is the tricky part. Um, so next, I will explain uh, how we did this. I'm, I'm happy to take any questions here about the blind rotation, if there are any. No. Okay, so how we moved from this, this vector to, these, uh, to this vector. Uh, so the, the idea is to, we have uh, called this algorithm homomorphic indicator, and I will just use the, the example for uh, k equal to four parties, okay? So we, we have a counter. I will explain what the counter is at the moment. Uh, but if uh, j equals to zero, so this, this j iterates over uh, an array that we defined at the beginning. So we have an array that we will call a, uh, old. This, this array is initialized by a, a ring GSW encryption of one, a ring GSW encryption of zeros, and so on. And you have uh, a mu, uh, which is also initialized like this. Okay. And the j iterates from top to bottom. So when we are at, at, the, at the very top level, uh, if the counter is, is one, then we just put an encryption of zero in, in this new uh, in this position. Otherwise, we take the position that was in the previous uh, array. Okay, we, we get the encryption of a old in this uh, zeros position of a new. For the rest of the of the indices, the update is the following. So we take um, the position, the j position of a new. It's going to be the previous position 
of a alt, but one step over if the counter is one, and it will take the, the position at the same level if the counter is zero. Okay. Notice that if we have k, uh, k equal to four, we have five um, uh, elements in this array. In this array. Okay. Regarding the counter, um, this is this corresponds to the ring CSW encryptions of the elements of the secret keys. Okay. So, for example, uh, the first counter will be one because it will be an encrypt a ring CSW encryption of the secret key of the first element of the secret key of the first participant. Okay. This is a, a ring CSW encryption of one. Okay. So if we run this iteration with uh, this counter, we'll see that uh, this one moves to the second position and so on and so forth. Then the second counter is going to be the ring of the encryption of the first position of the second party. Okay. And uh, the iteration will be the same since we have the zero at the top, uh, we will move the zero here. Now we have a one in the second position and we move this one to the next position and so on. The third counter is going to be one. And finally, in when the counter is zero, everything, if you just look at this iteration, everything stays the same. So you just uh, copy uh, this, this position here. Okay. And if you look closely, this part here, this vector of uh, Ring CSW encryptions of zeros and ones is actually the vector that, that we wanted before. Because the, the addition of this is going to give you three. So you want a one at the third position uh, of this. And this could be used as a bootstrapping key of the uh, Joan Palias scheme. Is there any question regarding how the homomorphic indicator works? So the, the interesting part here is how you instantiate this. This is a bit more technical, but I just put the, the, the algorithm here. So you start with these um, CIs. So these, these CIs are the the so if you think about the the secret keys of each participant you take uh so these secret keys have for example m components um then you sorry n components then you take each of the the secret keys are encrypted in ring csw's uh, ciphertext and then you take the first um element of each of the secret keys and you put the, them in these CIs. Okay, so this homomorphic indicator runs for every n in the uh, in the secret key positions of the TFAG secret keys. Okay, and the way that we do the selection is just a Cmax gate, and this gate allows you to pick a given uh, a CI, which is a ring GSW encryption of zero or one, you pick the ring learning with a cross encryption of A or J, if this gives you one, and if not, you pick this one, if this gives you zero. And uh, this, this other part here, is just the internal product um, of, um, sorry, the external product of this um, a old zero and one minus uh, CI, which is just the update of the top row of the of the arise. Okay. And now that we have a way to construct the bootstrapping keys, uh, sorry, to, to have a way to go from the the secret keys to um, a vector of uh, zeros and only one one, we can iterate this over all the elements of S. Okay, so the um, uh, to generate the global with the starting key, uh, we start with uh, a new and a old. Okay, and uh, 
this this first loop iterates over the the secret keys okay and the elements of the secret keys and um, we create these CIs uh, this is just taking the elements of s and encrypting them as ring GSWs ciphertext now that we have ring GSWs as controller bits as I explained before we can run the homomorphic indicator and get uh, the vector of uh, ones and zeros um, corresponding to the, for example, the first position of all the, the secret keys, and then for the second position and so on until the nth position, okay? Until we get um, k times n uh, bootstrapping keys, okay? And this is the final bootstrapping key, okay? And this is our uh, global bootstrapping key generation. And with this, since the, the format is exactly the same as the one in Perlias and Joas uh, paper, uh, we can just run bootstrapping, okay? And we have implemented this in, in Rust. Uh, the code is publicly available. And uh, I, I just want to, to go over some benchmarks of our uh, code. So, we run the test for um, from two parties to 16 parties. The, the degree of the polynomials for the ring learning with errors uh, is 2048. The learning with errors dimension varies um, here, but uh, it's, it's a wrong disorder. Then uh, the log Q for the learning with errors encryption is this. The, Look you for the ring learning with errors. I mean, our ring GSW is 64. These are the, the, the distributions for ring learning with errors and learning with errors. B and L are just, uh, for those that don't know, are just internal parameters of uh, the decomposition that happens inside the ring uh, GSW. And we we tested this over an average of 500 NAN bootstrappings. And uh, for every set the, of parameters that we tested, we managed to find one that gives you uh, time less than second, as you can see here in, in bold. The, the bootstrapping noise, uh, it's defined like it's like this. So this is in 64 bits and then uh, uh, there is a typo here, but uh, this is in 32 bits uh, after key switching at the end. Okay. And this this last column is the the bootstrapping noise that we have in the generation of the bootstrapping keys. So this is the the noise that we have after running the the homomorphic indicator. Um, this noise comes from the fact that we are doing the, these Cmax gates, which basically imply that we need to do uh, k internal products. Okay, the k being the number of parties, so we need to do k internal products to produce these bootstrapping keys. Okay. Um, yeah. So I wanted to finish by saying uh, the, the the problems that we have in, in in our scheme. One is this that we at the moment we have to do K internal products to produce a bootstrapping keys. Uh, we would like to um, get this down a bit, um, but we still don't know how to do. And then uh, also the, the bootstrapping key time, uh, the, the generation of the, of, the, of the bootstrapping keys is quite high. So for example, for the K16 and V7 and L6 is almost an hour. Um, so this is something that we can also improve a lot on. And again, this is our, our construction. So if you want to, to contact us, it's uh, this is Jungun's email. This is my email. And uh, you can have the briefing here, which also includes a GitHub uh, repository. Um, and I put a lot of references uh, at the end if you want to have a look and learn more about the, the multi-party, multi-key uh, part of our work. Thank you, Sergey.
Yeah. I'd, like to op I'd like to open it up to everyone who has a question or a comment. Uh, don't be shy. It doesn't have to be a complicated question and um, it doesn't have to be a question at all. But we'll take a minute to see if anyone has anything to say. Looks like we had uh, one more question or comment in the chat as well. Yeah, I'm reading. Uh, so for just one bit, we should use bit with average of the bit of error. Uh, yeah, so yeah, we, we run, we, we pick these parameters after running the uh, lattice estimator um, with the distributions that we needed after the after doing the, the internal products um we tried so the main problem is here that we need to run over uh 60, 60 modulus six uh log 64. Uh, so we we try to to get this down to uh, um 32 uh, but we still are not sure if we can do it or not uh, so maybe if, if we manage to do this then we can reduce this 2048 uh, a bit, yeah. Uh, does your scheme allow for encryptions by third parties? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, could, could you expand it a bit? I mean, the, the encryption uh, can be done by anybody that has the uh, oh no 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 yes yeah, so uh, you can encrypt but then you will not be able to get the result because you need to be uh, you will not have part of, of the of the secret key that was generated at the beginning and uh, yeah in order to be able to decrypt uh, somebody needs to share uh, that with you but that's not so the idea is to have uh, a collection of parties and then all of them generate the public key, add them together, and decryption. I didn't go over decryption here, but happens by sharing partial decryptions among the, the participants. Okay. Um, but if you trust at least one of the parties, you can still hide your data. Yeah, I actually didn't think about this before. So you could send the, the encryption under the public key that is generated by somebody, somebody else, like a collection of parties, to the server. Um, and then you wouldn't participate in the decryption part. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually a good idea. I didn't think about this before. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, I don't know if yes, this actually makes sense. Uh, I need to give it a, a bit more <laughs> uh, thought about this, yeah. Uh, which is faster in computing? Um, so I would say multi-key or, Yeah, no, so, sorry, sorry, no, no, uh, it's, it's, sorry, no, 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 multi-party because you are just doing, uh, it's, it's just the same as the single key uh, setting in the multi-party setting, sorry. Yeah. So you can think about multi-party as being as efficient as a single key setting. The, un, the, the problem is how you generate the bootstrapping key and also um, in, in the public key that you're generating, you have higher noise than in the single key setting, of course, because you you do additions. Okay, so you also need to take this into account. But in terms of of uh, computation time, I would say that multi-party. Yeah. Sorry about the slip. Will the multi-party HE need larger memory? Mm. 
yeah so you would need bigger bootstrapping keys for sure uh, so in our in our case, for example, uh, I'm not sure about all of the multi-party schemes, but in our case, uh, if you look at the paper, we have a table about the numbers and they are quite big uh, because we have a lot. So Princess W separatists are very big um, and we have a lot of them uh, depending on the number of parties. So yes. Um, so that's multi-party similar to Shamir secret sharing in classical crypto. Yes, so the so in all of these schemes you have uh, what is called a distribution a distributed um, decryption. So you can think of it as uh, having secret shares of of the secret key and then um, merging them together. The main difference between uh, Shemit secret sharing in classical crypto and the multi-party uh, sharing that you have is that in the multi-party setting, no party. No party knows ever the secret key. So in the secret sharing, you need to generate the secret key and then share it among the participants. But in the multi-party setting, you have uh, each individual party generates this uh, these keys, and then um, they they can decrypt. But non-individual party knows the secret key at any given point. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the questions. Okay, we'll give a few more minutes for some more questions. Yeah, sure. What is the size overhead for binary encryptions? Uh, let me think for a second. So, Yeah, I don't know if I have the numbers at the moment at hand. Uh, let me check. Yeah, I think we didn't run the numbers for the actual encryption. We only care about the bootstrapping part. So. so. But in the multi-party setting, you don't actually, you have the same overhead as in the single key setting. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you have an overhead on the, on the multi-key uh, part because you have this expansion and as I said, uh, the the overhead is linear or quadratically in the number of parties. I don't, I couldn't say you now exactly for binary encryption and for a particular one, but if uh, you want some overhead, for example, the for k parties uh, for sixteen parties, and um, we have, for example, that the bootstrapping key size is two gigabytes, so it's quite big. <laughs> But this is for the bootstrapping key. All right. If there are no more questions in the next uh, half minute, we'll go ahead and close down. Perfect. All right, on behalf of everyone here, I'd love to thank Sergey for making this a down to earth and enjoyable experience. Much <laughs> appreciate you. you coming and presenting. And thank, thank you everyone for asking your questions as well. Um, the resources from this, including this, this video will be uploaded uh, likely tomorrow. So thank you everyone. Thank you, goodbye.